your screen to type your questions. Please also address your notes to all moderators and these questions will be posed for the benefit of the group. If we do not get to all of your questions today, we will follow up with you after the event. If at any time you experience technical difficulties, please send a note to me, moderator Nara, or you can contact AT&T Connect Support at 1-888-796-6118. I would now like to turn the conference over to Lynn O'Hara. Please go ahead. Good afternoon and good evening. My name is Lynn O'Hara and I'm the Director of Programs for National History Day. I'm thrilled and really appreciate the fact that you've taken the time to join us this evening. Uh, tonight, National History Day is going to be partnering with some of our leaders at National Archives and Records Administration. Um, to talk about kind of how to do History Day, but also what kind of resources are available to help you. My job tonight is just to kind of give a little bit of an overview. The goal of National History Day is really to help students become historians and teach critical thinking skills. The reason why I think National History Day is so powerful is because it puts learning in the hands of the students. And our presenter tonight will talk a little bit about some of the case studies and will speak to not only a teacher but also a student this evening. This is a program where students do research and create the product of their choice, whether that be a paper, website, a museum exhibit, a performance, or a documentary. As you can see on the screen, we have a theme every year. This year, we're talking about rights and responsibilities in history. The goal of having a theme is to promote critical thinking, to take it from being a report or an encyclopedia article about a historical person or event, and to have the students analyze what is important about their person or event and how they fit into the larger scope of history. What I'd like to do for a second is just to take you to the National History Day website. We know that many of you are teachers and many of you are first year teachers working with this. I want you to pay attention to the classroom connection section. That section of the History Day website is designed specifically to help teachers and students. It's essentially the classroom component. Some things that we can highlight, upcoming webinars are always posted at the top. We are running our Normandy Sacrifice for Freedom Institute next summer. There's information for anyone who might be interested in applying there. But most importantly, I want to take you to the teacher resources link. From here at the top is essentially the one-stop shop for the most important things that you need in order to accomplish National History Day. You have some general resources at the top. But as you move down, we take History Day and break it down into its component steps. And what we have included is resources, real, live, classroom-tested resources used by middle and high school teachers across the country with real students. As you can see, most of them are in Word format, and that's intentional, so that you can take them and adapt, well, excuse me, adapt or edit them to the needs of your students. In addition, you have tip videos. Essentially, think of this as your mentor teacher helping you through certain steps. This is obviously a project in development. These are things that we're working on. But I think that they are a great resource as you're getting started. Also want to mention that we do a lot of different programming. We have a teacher newsletter that goes out once a month. I'm not a big fan of um, using things just to do things. Um, we send out once a month. This is the November 1st one. It shows you a student writing opportunity that we have coming up, information on our summer institutes, our webinars, including tonight's. Um, if you're going to be at the NCSS conference or the American Association of School Librarians conference, please come in and see us. Give us a shout out. You can hear a little bit about different programs and see some different education resources. So that's kind of my overview, but I don't want to take too much time here this evening. What I would like to do is turn the presentation over to Ann Riddell, who is the Deputy Coordinator for NHD in Philadelphia. And she's going to tell you a little bit about History Day from her perspective. OK, thanks so much, Lynn. Well, I've been doing History Day for 20 some years now, and um, I never tire of talking about it. So I'm hoping that I can keep to my um, allotted time tonight um, but I encourage uh, anyone who has questions and don't get, they don't get answered tonight, uh, you are welcome to uh, email me directly at any point. My uh, contact information is up on this first slide. 
I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about the whys and some of the what. Lynn covered some of the what of National History Day, but I always think the whys are just as important to talk about. Why do we do what we do, um, and why do National History Day? We just had our kickoff workshop uh, for teachers here in Philadelphia a couple of weeks ago, and we also hosted pre-service teachers from Temple University, and I had a student ask me a great question. Why do National History Day? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight. So what does National History Day mean? National History Day is active learning. Not that passive stuff where kids are just listening to those names and dates. But National History Day gives students an, um, a chance to formulate and discuss historical questions. So they can ask the questions that maybe they've always wanted to ask, or maybe they didn't know how to ask, and this program gives them the chance to do that. They get to learn the process of you know, asking questions, of um, doing historical research, and the skills to find the answer. So we help students ask questions, and then we help them find, find uh, the answers. And by doing that, we help them imagine the past in a more dynamic way. The past isn't a static thing, but as we, um, as we learn about more sources, as the students add to the primary sources that they're, they're consulting, they learn that they too can become historians and put together a historical interpretation. National History Day also means source perspective, and critical thinking. Now, these are two very important keys to this program. Um, students have a tendency, even if they've um, already started doing primary source work, to read um, sources the way they would read any textbook. You know, it's an old document. It's written down. That must be what it says. So one of the things that a program like National History Day does is help students understand that every source that they will look at has a, a perspective. And understanding the perspective of that source will help them to see that uh, the more sources they have, the more perspectives they have, the fuller the story is. Um, so uh, discovering that importance of multiple sources and perspectives is just critical. And along with that is, of course, critically thinking thinking, why was this source written when it was? Who wrote it? Um, will help students um, critically think, not just about history projects, but question all the sources of, of information that they consult, which is just a valuable skill, but lifelong. National History Day also is about free choice learning. Um, and there are several layers of choice for students, and we all know how important choice is when it comes to learning. We learn better the things we choose to learn. So as Lynn mentioned, students choose a topic within uh, an annual theme, and then they get to choose how to present their work. So they can either choose to uh, choose a category that is comfortable to them. Maybe they feel that their skills are, um, in, are very visual and want to do an exhibit. Or maybe they feel like that has been their skills, but they want to challenge themselves by doing a, a performance. So students can choose to stay within their comfort zone. Maybe that first year, uh, that's a, a good idea for them. But then they can also challenge themselves with the um, other types of topics. And I think that's just so valuable. National history generates an excitement about learning that I can guarantee you haven't seen for, for a history anywhere else. Um, the context format motivates the students. Now, we as, uh, as educators all understand that um, what the real goal is, some of the things we've been talking about, critical thinking, source perspective, being able to you know, analyze documents, put together a narrative. That's what it's all about, good history education. But the contest format motivates the students in a way that kind of takes it up a notch for them. The students um, present their work to judges and receive feedback. And this is something that one of the National History Day Philly teachers just talked about at that uh, kickoff I mentioned, that um, 
by asking the students to present their work to outside judges, that, again, gives the students um, a level of uh, motivation and incentive that they might not have if they're just, just, I put that in quotes, just presenting it to their teachers. So this helps them to, to understand, oh, I'm going to be showing my work to someone else. Um, and then, of course, students can do in-depth work because at each level of the competition, should students advance, um, they can go from probably a school competition in most cases to a regional or district competition, state and national. At each level of the contest, students get feedback from those judges we talked about. Um, and if that's the case, um, then students can go back and revise and refine their work and see new sources. So they really get to study a topic in depth that they might not have been able to were it not for the, for the contest, especially with all the um, uh, prescriptions and things like that that are um, in the classroom and only so much time. So I hope I've convinced you <laughs> that this is something um, you should do and, and help explain to you the whys of, of why do National History Day. Here is how you can get started. Um, uh, Lynn already showed you the National History Day website. That's such an amazing resource. Um, to start the process, you want to reach out. And you've already begun that by joining today. But now find out who your state coordinator is by going to the National History Day website. Um, find out who your local coordinator is. That's going to be your, your best contact because they're the, they're the closest to you. They can tell you about your local contact. Then reach out um, to colleagues who have done National History Day. Um, as Lynn mentioned, knowing what, what other teachers have done is really important because they have faced the same challenges that, that you will face, and they've come up with a variety of methods to deal with those challenges. So kind of checking in with people and hearing what some of the, their tips and, and techniques are um, is, is a great experience. And then I always encourage people who are doing History Day, students, teachers, even our judges, many of whom come from archives, museums, and libraries, to reach out. Uh, we are here as a group for you. Um, we, um, as, at, at, at the National Archives, at museums, at libraries, want to work with you and your students. So, um, we try to reach out to you as much as possible, and please reach out to us or your local uh, county historical society, state historical society, you know, museum, whatever kind of cultural resources you have, reach out to them, and they will be glad to hear from you. Now, I wanted to let you know that um, to find out if you have a National Archives facility near you, or where your nearest one is, I should say, I have on this slide um, our website, which is archives.gov, and you can just go to location, and then you'll find out your closest facility. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, um, Elizabeth, and she can tell you more about our resource. Good evening, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Dinshall. And um, I am at the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum in West Branch, Iowa. And today I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about the NARA resources that we have available um, through some of our websites. And I'm going to start with archives.gov. Um, to give you guys a, a little overview of what it's like. So we're going to start here. This is the front page of the National Archives. And you can see right in the middle here, this button is the Teacher's Resource button. And when it takes you here, there's a bunch of different options. And we're going to look at a few of them, some different things that can can help you guys out the most. Um, and we are going to talk about uh, Doc's Teach in a little bit. But you can see here at the bottom there's the National History Day Resources page. 
and it's going to give you some different options for things to look at. Um, one of the things you can look at is starting your research online. And it will give you some different options broken down into time periods uh, for how you can start researching online. And they're very loose time periods, so you can see like the Great Depression and World War II, and you can guide your students through this part of it. Something else that I'll talk to you about, um, and Ange talked a little bit about it, is starting your research in person. And you'll see here in the corner, it'll give you some locations for where you can start. But one of the things they stress is contacting before you visit and finding out the under 18 policy, which will be really important. And I have an archivist here with me tonight that will talk a little bit about the research room procedures for if you visit in person. You can also see the student and teacher workshop links here. Um, you see ours up here tonight. Um, and we are going to do a judges training webinar in the, the winter time in January. Um, but you can see some of the locations that are offering teachers workshops. Back here. We're going to go back into the teacher section and go to special topics and tools. And one of, there's a few great things on here, but I'm going to scroll down to the bottom to the document analysis worksheets. And these are really helpful for students, especially the younger ones that have not worked with primary sources before. Um, you can see it gives you some different options for what primary sources we might have in our collection. So we'll take a look at written documents here, and it, we'll pull up a PDF of a worksheet if it will work, that will show, take your students step by step of the process of anal um, analyzing their documents. And you can see here, you can print it or it's fillable, but it will ask them what type of document is in here, um, the physical characteristics of it, the dates associated with it. And all of these analysis pages will also help them with their process papers when they get to them. Um, after that, you can see we have some links on iTunes U, and I would open it for you, but I do not have iTunes on my computer, and it will just yell at me. But it offers um, some different courses and podcasts that you can download through iTunes, um, so you can listen to those. There's also this really interesting feature called History Pin, and History Pin will give you a guided tour, and it will tell you you're leaving the National Archives of different important parts of history. And for example, this is the March on Washington. And they're utilizing Google Earth technology to kind of help your students conceptualize where it happened in history and the photographs associated with it and documents associated with it. And it will put it into a map format so that they can see the tour and see the documents with their associated location, which is really interesting. Um, I'm having a little bit of a hard time loading it, but I, I think we can all get the idea and you guys can see, you can see where it's starting from. You can see the map tours with the pins on it. Um, it's a really great resource for your visual learners. Um, you'll see our YouTube content for educators, and this is where this webinar will be posted later as well. But it has different um, topics that you can search through that will help you teach a little bit um, in the classroom, too. We also have ebooks on here, um, which are, of course, helpful. And I think now we're going to switch to our docs teach. Um, and I'd just like to say, too, when you're in the archives part, you can look at the distance learning. A lot of places like Hoover will offer distance learning to classrooms all over the country. They don't have to be in West Branch, Iowa, per se. So now we're going to switch over to Docs Teach. And if you're not familiar with Docs Teach, it's a phenomenal educator's resource. Um, for anybody teaching really any subject you can get into in the docs teach. But you can kind of see tucked away here on the bottom, we have a National History Day link. I'm not up here for you. 
So once we're in here, it'll tell you um, a little bit about National History Day and link you to the pages. But it'll give you different um, different topics that you can kind of choose from. And it'll link our primary sources to them. So we can pick anything in here. Let me see. There's one I wanted to look at specifically. The atomic bomb was a really popular topic last year. I saw four of them when I was judging. Um, but you can click right into the documents and activities, and it'll bring documents related to that atomic bomb. So this one is a telegram, and it'll actually pull up the primary source, and you can blow it up here. Uh, you can print them as well. And it'll allow you to zoom in so you can read them better um, if you have a hard time seeing them. Um, but it'll just give you a good idea of where to start for research for your students. Now if we go up to teaching activities, um, we can click on that. And here, this will give you some different options. It'll tell you who wrote it. So this one was written by the National Archives, but we have a lot of submissions from teachers. Um, it'll tell you the tools. So this one's a compare and contrast exercise. It'll tell you what time period it's from. And then they use the Bloom's taxonomy to tell you where it falls in the social studies teaching um, spectrum. So you can see the activity here, and it'll give you notes to go through it. And if you decide that you want to alter this activity and make it your own lesson plan as a teacher, you can go in to create an activity, and you'll create a login, and it will save all the lesson plans that you create with the primary source documents. And you can kind of pull from the different, um, the different topics that you have or the, the different subjects that you'd like to use asking me to log in, which I'm not going to do right now. Um, but if we go back here, you can see where the activity will start for the teachers. And it will walk you right through the lesson plans, the primary source documents, the related worksheets to it, and the exercises that you can do in the classroom. So you can see here, it'll take you through. This is the introduction and it'll tell you about it, and you can pull the documents up here. And it will tell you about the speech and where you can find it. So DocsTeach is a fantastic um, resource for teachers that are really interested in, um, in working with those primary sources and, and getting their students um, active in them. So now I want to hand it over to our archivist, Matt, um, and he's going to talk about this idea of going to the National Archives and how you get started with research. And hi, I'm Matt Schaefer with the Hoover Library, and Elizabeth is going to be my Vanna White here flipping through my slides as I, as I go through my talk. What I, my goal here is to demystify the process of archival research. I know for many of you teachers, and I pretty much guarantee for your students, uh, National History Day will lead them for the first time into an archives. Um, it's a different kind of information retrieval system. There are different procedures and protocols. And so I'm going to talk about your first contact will probably be at a distance. Uh, you will contact your friendly neighborhood your, or your friendly NARA archivist. Uh, not all archives are, are uh, congenial toward History Day students. Uh, a way to get a read on that is to check their website if they have NHD topics, if they have, you know, um, a youth, you know, like a, a teaching-centered or student-centered um, link on their web page, that's a good sign. Contact that. I, I would say that, uh, like the National Archives, guaranteed, you will, you will be met and you will be welcomed as a researcher. Um, I can't guarantee that for, for all archives. Uh, what we do, uh, we've worked with History Day students here at the Hoover Library for at least 15 years. Uh, we work with students on linking them with the best primary sources that we can find, whether they're here in our shop, whether they're online uh, at another, re in another archival resource, another archi archives, or, um, you know, work with them in a, in a lot of ways, you know, right-sizing their topic, getting it to the appropriate level of sophisticated, you know, of, of um, uh, 
appropriate magnitude. So, you know, it's not during the Great Depression. If they call and ask us for resources on the Great Depression related to rights and responsibilities, that's a little too broad. And we're going to try to work them down the chain to get to a tighter topic that they can actually hope to present in a paper or, or an exhibit. Um, the process is interactive and there's a lot of back and forth. Savannah, next slide, please. Um, but it usually starts with either a phone call or an email to an archivist. And um, we, there will be some back and forth uh, on the phone or in the email, uh, trying to get the topic figured out, uh, making sure that we can identify whether they've contacted the right archives, uh, whether we actually have resources that will be of use to them. If it turns out we do and they're close enough to come in and do research, we will strongly encourage them to come in and do research. Because even though there's a boatload, yeah, technical archival term, a boatload of stuff on the web, it pales in comparison by what's actually in the archives. I'm going to say less than one tenth of one percent of anybody's collection is scanned and accessible uh, at a distance. And until you can get into an archive, I mean, if you get into an archive, you'll see that immediately, and you really don't know what you're going to find until you start opening boxes and folders. And that's part of the excitement. That's part of what makes National History Day. Um, so much for, fun for us as archivists and also for the students. Um, when they come into the library, they will be faced with something that not, uh, you know, they, the students who do history today tend to be bright, tend to be motivated, tend to know the way around the library. They're going to come into an archives and immediately be faced with something that they don't face at the public library or at the school library, a reference interview. Uh, it's, you know, this is what we do for any researcher who comes in, you know, uh, man, woman, child, uh, no matter what their experience, because as archivists, the more we know about your question, the more we know about your research topic, the better we can serve you, the better we can link you to the materials that will answer the questions you want to ask. Um, this interview uh, takes place, uh, you know, before we, before we bring out any collections, it takes five to ten minutes. Uh, part of the process, uh, as I'm demonstrating here with my colleague Spencer, is, is a back and forth conversation. This is really, um, uh, it, it's for us to figure out where you're going. The next step in the process is to get a registration form. Again, this is not, this is not something uh, that, you know, that we reserve for history students. We do this for every researcher who comes into our shop. You know, we want their name, we want their point of contact. Um, you know, for the National Archives, these forms end up as part of a researcher file. Students often get a kick out of that to know that they're going to be part uh, of our collections for a while. Um, and we work as, as far as we can in this five, you know, this five to eight minute interview to figure out what of our collections best meets their needs, you know, gets them closest to the materials they'll need to, to answer the questions they're asking. Why does this go on? Uh, because research in an archives is different than research in a library. Um, because we're talking about materials in archives that are unique, uh, that they're, they're organized by collection, not by books. There's, the, the way you get access to it is through a finding aid, not through an online public access catalog. Um, you know, where a bright student can, uh, can hope to go into a library and find their way to what they need and shelf read their way to really good secondary sources. That's physically impossible in archives because it's a closed stacks operation. So, you know, this, this reference interview, this front end uh, question I'm answering, is, is vitally important. And uh, I know when I was a young student, History Day hadn't been invented. Yeah, I am that old. Um, it would have scared the bejesus out of me to go and ask an adult these kinds of questions to, you know, actually engage. Uh, it's, it's a useful life skill, and uh, it's worth the time and trouble. Um, finding aids, I, you know, it's, it's a specific archival way of describing material. We just, they, they all have very similar elements. They talk about the creator. There's a title of the collection. It talks about span dates, um, how, how big it is. It gives a biography or, or, or an institutional history. It uh, talks about what you can expect to find in the collection. And then a box and folder listing. That's also like a lot of information for any specific collection. And I can tell you, yes, it is. It's a very rich information packet, uh, but it's often, uh, because it's, it's meant to be compact and easily, easily you know, sort of a, 
easily transportable information packet. There's a lot of things that aren't known or not told in a finding aid. Our collection descriptions, descriptions stop at the folder level. And we, you know, I'm always saying to kids and researchers, you know, after you're into that box and into that folder for 30 minutes, you're going to know about more about whatever you're researching than I do. And they're, they're, they're thunderstruck. They don't believe that for a minute until they demonstrate it to me. And they'll come up with something that they found in the folder and say, look what I found. It, it answers my question. I say, that's outstanding. I didn't know that was there. And that's part of the joy of discovery, part of the joy of doing research in National History Day. Um, Finding aids are, are you know, the, the, the archival equivalent of an online public access catalog. Um, the students, you know, the researchers will then, you know, have to use the finding aids, talk to the archivist, will fill out a call slip, and they will give the call slip to the archivist, who will then go back into the stacks, into the closed stacks area, and retrieve the material for the, you know, for the researcher. Um, public's not allowed back here. Uh, were they allowed back here, it would be kind of pointless because the collections, uh, you know, thousands of boxes arranged by the collection. Uh, you could be there for hours before you found what you were looking for if you didn't know uh, the specific location and the specific collection. Uh, we get the box, we load it on a cart, bring it back to the reading room where we sit down and uh, archivists the, the world around will say, let me walk you through reading room procedures and protocols. We ask that you use these materials one box, one folder at a time, Placing the box the now card, using a pencil only to, um, to take your notes. Uh, maintain the original order within the collection. This order is actually, uh, has information of value in and of itself. And I, I think I've used that phrase long, often enough and uh, long enough that it's going to be on my tombstone. One box, one folder at a time. Please maintain that original order, pencils only. And, you know, then we let, them, we let the students go at it. And they are uh, often mystified because it's a very different information pre presentation system. There's no, there's no table of contents for a box of materials. There's just a, bo a box of folder list describing what's in there. And they get into the boxes of folders and discover, okay, this folder that's labeled correspondence, bonus march 1932, covers a lot of ground. It's got letters from the president. It's got letters from the Secretary of War. It's got letters from individual citizens all around the country. And it's all arranged in date order. Okay. There's, there, there's some, you know, you, you've got to do some, some serious thinking about how you're going to use, use, use these materials and use them in a presentation. Um, usually, when we have History Day students here, uh, they have a day or two, often, you know, you know we're talking about hours, at, you know, hours in the reading room, uh, and they get back and start doing the project and realize, oh, uh, I'm sorry, I've gone too far. I have questions that I meant to have, that I think maybe would have been answered by the resources at, at the Hoover Library, but I didn't, I didn't take notes or I didn't make a copy of it. And there's always a follow-up. And that's not unique to history students. That happens for researchers who are writing their, their first book, their third book, their, their you know, their nth article. Um, part of what I like about History Day is it gets students to think and understand that they are just young researchers. They're, they're not students after, you know, after they've done this for a little bit. They are just 15-year-old researchers with the same problems, the same processes, the same issues facing, you know, the professor of history down, the, you know, down at the local university. Um, what I like about, also about History Day, as I think Ange mentioned, is the levels of competition gives students to do, uh, the chance to do something here that they don't always get a chance to do, which is to go back over work they've done and improve. And that, that next level improvement can be going back and doing more archival research. It can be just reframing, the, you know, reframing their analysis. But it gives them a chance to, uh, to engage, the pro you know, engage with their research more than once. Bang. Ten minutes. Thank you. Okay, and uh, this is Elizabeth Dinchel again. We're going to hand it over to to Millie. Um, I just wanted to address there is a couple anxious students uh, typing in the the notes here, asking where they can find the archives. Guys, if you go back to archives.gov and click on locations, you can find a location in the states um, of where you live, and we put that in there. So please do visit the archives.gov to find a location. All right. We'll hand this off to you.
Hi, I'm Millie Fries. I'm the State Coordinator for National History Day in Iowa. Um, Matt's going to be a hard act to follow, and first I have to give some kudos to the Hoover Library and to Matt especially. I think he turned all three of my children into professional researchers, and they're all out in the world now, and History Day was an important part of what propelled them into their college and careers, um, and just the being treated like real researchers and learning the skills there, um, a lot of that happened at the Hoover Library. So it's, a, it's just a great experience for kids on that front. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, feedback and how students progress through the contest levels. Um, let me get to my slide here. There we go. Um, one of the unique things about History Day is that students can seek and use feedback throughout the entire process of their History Day journey. I'm finding as a state coordinator now that more and more students are contacting me early in their process, even at the topic selection, asking feedback on a topic, you know, to find out if a topic is um, viable for a History Day project. Will there be enough resources? Is it unique enough? Or does it have significance and impact in history as opposed to just a, an interesting story? So I will converse with students on topics and topic selection and give feedback at that level. Um, sometimes students ask, you know, is it okay to ask the state coordinator? Is it okay to ask a district coordinator questions about this early in the process? Yes, that's what we're here for. Uh, please contact us. Our, all of our, the state coordinator contact information is on the National History Day website, and we are always excited to take questions. Um, feedback from, or for students at the contest level comes from judges' feedback forms. At the contest, students will, their projects will be evaluated. Um, judges will look at the historical quality, the connection to the theme, the clarity of presentation. There's a rubric they'll fill out on the um, judge comment form. But what's most helpful to the students are the written comments that judges give that tell um, what they thought the strengths and maybe areas of possible improvement were for the project. Now, part of the problem is always going to be that um, judges don't always give the best feedback. They may fill that comment sheet with written comments that are really helpful. Sometimes judges say something really useless like, this was a really great project, congratulations. Um, and that doesn't help students know what to do to improve. So one of the skills that students who are engaged in National History Day learn quickly is how to go solicit feedback when maybe what they got from the judges isn't so helpful. Teachers are a great source of feedback. Um, your own teachers, plus other teachers in the building or in the school or in the district who may have expertise in your topic um, or in, in a style of presentation. You may be doing a History Day project with a talented and gifted teacher or a studies teacher, but if you're doing a performance, ask the drama teacher for some feedback um, or perform for your school group, you know, your class or something and get some feedback from other students or other teachers. Um, District and state History Day staff are always excited to give feedback. We do what we can with the time we've got to make sure we address all of the students' questions. Another source for feedback would be to contact university professors or college professors in your area or community college professors who may have some expertise in the topic. One thing you need to really concentrate on and help your students understand is that they need to ask early. If you're going to an expert to ask for feedback on something, um, your urgency may not be their priority at that point. So please don't, you know, contact a professor and say, can you read my historical paper and give me written comments and talk to me about it tomorrow because they won't have time to do that. Think ahead and ask early. Um, same thing when approaching an archives or, um, or other sources of information. Um, plan ahead. Start the process early. Don't wait till the last minute. All right, with feedback that students get on their National History Day projects, they need to determine if the feedback is good and useful or if it's just, you know, an opinion that may, they may or may not be able to incorporate. I've seen students take judges' sheets or other written evaluations and act like it's a checklist where they have to do, you know, one by one down the points that were, were listed. They have to make those corrections or make those changes. Um, one of the hidden, I think, skills or hidden values of History Day is that students have to learn how to read and assess the feedback that they get. 
Um, maybe some feedback would be interesting, but it would take them off into a direction that doesn't, isn't where they're trying to go with their project, so it doesn't really help them. Um, or, you know, it may be something that takes them off topic or off theme. But students really have to evaluate the feedback and figure out if a judge says you need to add this, this, and this, well, will that fit the scope? Will it make my paper or my documentary too long? What would I take out if I want to put this in? They just have to learn to evaluate the feedback, choose what's relevant, and I think this is essential to the critical thinking skill development that History Day really strives to, to work with in students, to give them that idea that, you know, you are responsible for your learning. You're going to get feedback. You have to decide what is useful um, and how to use it. Um, another thing that um, is good for students to seek and get feedback on through the contest cycle are their written materials. If they're doing um, a documentary performance website or exhibit, they have to do a process paper and a bibliography. Um, please, teachers, help students know to start this early. If they start the night before contest and they're trying to print it on the morning on the way loading the car, it's not going to make this a pleasant experience for anyone. Um, so get those things, encourage them to work on those things early and to receive feedback on them. Have someone read them and, 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 and give them feedback and let them know if they're, if they're on target. Um, same thing with the historical paper. People to read it, you know, and figure out if, 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 if students are on the mark, if they are organized, um, presenting the information well. All of those things are helpful to students along the way, and as much feedback as they can get um, is a good thing. Um, students typically will enter either a local or a regional contest as their first point of entry into the History Day contest cycle. And when they are selected at, at a level of contest to advance to the next level, one of the other extremely valuable components of History Day is the fact that they are um, actually they are expected to improve their project between levels. Uh, very rarely is a project entered at districts done and ready to go the whole way through the contest cycle. Students will get feedback from judges, teachers, other people who have looked at their project, and then they work to improve it. It may mean additional research. It may mean completely taking apart an exhibit and putting it back together again so it's more visual, um, less text intensive, um, but they, they need to improve it at that level. Um, after the district contest, if they are selected to advance to state, then again, the competition gets much stiffer at the state level and they are expected to improve their projects, again, based on feedback they've received from judges, um, teachers, or any other experts um, they've consulted. Students are usually really excited about the opportunity to advance in contest, and they're usually um, starting, you know, wanting to start their revisions almost before the award ceremony is complete. So um, it's usually not difficult to motivate students to do the improvements that are needed or to use the feedback and to improve their projects because they are, they are ready and raring to go for the next level. Um, sometimes the improvements, the feedback will suggest finding additional sources, um, additional primary sources. Sometimes, you know, I've got some pictures of an exhibit here that was one of Iowa's projects at Nationals. Sometimes students completely take apart an exhibit and put it back together because through the process of being judged and being evaluated and receiving feedback, they've figured out maybe a better way to convey their, their information and their analysis um, in a more visual way or a more organized way, and they take things completely apart and they start completely over. Um, but that's you know, one, of the, one of the joys of History Day. It's never, never, never really finished. Um, I think, let's see. Um, one of the, or, yeah. when students then are selected from the state contest to attend nationals, in Iowa, I work with the students to help um, provide some feedback and some improvements for projects. Um, and it helps sometimes at that level if you have people giving feedback who have seen what the national contest looks like. Um, it's an amazing experience, and to get to guide students all the way through is, um, is just a joy, and it's one of the best parts of my job is to work with students and see where they're going. Um, Langston Hughes once said, a poem is never finished, only abandoned, and that's really true for History Day projects as well. At some point, you have to take them to contest and turn, you know, 
work over to the judges. Um, but most students, even when they've made it all the way through the national contest, they will still be looking for information on a topic they've studied. It will still their interest, and it will stick with them forever. Um, and with that, then, we will turn it over to Hanadi. Hi, my name is Hanadi Chatara, and I um, am a middle school teacher. I teach 7th and 8th grade social studies in uh, the school district of Philadelphia. Um, I also teach a National History Day class, which consists of 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. Um, my contact information is right there on the slide if you need to reach out to me at all, any questions, um, particularly for teachers who are doing this for the first time. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at any time. Um, what I want to talk to you guys about is how I pretty much um, started National Today at my school with another colleague of mine and how it's progressed throughout the five years that we've been doing it. Um, it actually started as an after-school program where we got kids to come in after school to do the research. And as a first-year National History Day coordinator, I didn't know what that would entail. Um, I really wanted to do something like science fair, but for history, because I'm such a history lover and um, I love teaching social studies. Um, and so I found that we got some kids involved, but not many. We really, our first year started out with two projects. And as um, years went on, it became more and more popular, to, and we've ex exponentially grown into a, um, an elective at our school. Um, some things that I wanted to, or some advice I wanted to give to um, first-time National Today teachers is to um, really just allow students to really get invested in their topics and in their projects. Um, and the only way for students to continue to work on this long-term project is to really have a love for it, to really be into their topic. Um, some other advice I would give to them is to also be patient. This historical thinking is very, very difficult for students, especially since I teach middle school students. It's really hard for them to really think, you know, in the long term. And what I've done to really guide students is to really structure it for them so that they understand that, you know, every piece of your research is important. Every assignment or every um, project that I get to them is really important for the National History Day project. Um, for example, um, this year I've been focusing on every week I'm having um, kids work on an aspect of the project, like a timeline or doing primary search, uh, searches or even, like, um, two weeks ago, we spent a whole week just working on a thesis statement. Uh, this week, for example, I'm ha helping students be able to speak in front of the judges, and so I'm having them do presentations in front of the class, and the class is going to access the judges and asking them questions so that they're able to speak freely about their topic in their own way. Um, also, um, our school purchased a National History Day curriculum book, which has been very helpful in actually breaking certain things down, especially the thesis statement, and how to actually research um, for our students. Um, in the pictures that you see, on um, the picture to the right, there's two students right there, and they're actually reading a um, 16th century memoir from one of the conquistadors from Spain. It's translated into English, and they're focusing on um, how the conquistadors treated the Native Americans in um, New Spain. So they are really just engaging with the material. Um, another thing, too, is technology is very, very important for National History Day, in particular when you're making websites and documentaries. Um, last year, unfortunately, at our school, we didn't have the opportunity to have computers. We only had computers once a week. And um, with that, you're just being very flexible and trying to find ways to get kids to complete the project without you having the technology. And what's really fortunate is that the picture at the bottom, those are my students who had placed last year in first, second, and third an honorable mention at the National History Day Philly Contest. And that was the year where we only had computers once a week. And we just found other ways to print and be able to engage with primary source material as well as secondary source materials and still be able to do well and be successful at the competition. Um, a couple of other things that I wanted to mention is that um, have your students really focus on the impact. Why is their event so important in history, their event, their person, their situation? Why, what, what is the impact? What did they do for history? Every day I'm asking the students, why is your topic important? What's the point? Why is it important in history? Who cares about it? And push them every day to really understand 
how to really get beyond just the book report. So tell them this is not a book report. This is for you to go above and beyond. And give me a point. Give me something that I can work with so that people can really see that you're thinking historically, you're thinking like a historian. And then also, bring me back to the theme. Um, I think I had one year where a student did not really relate his topic to the theme, and he didn't do as well. Um, so just to continue to remind the kids of the theme, of the theme, every time. Have them read the theme sheet over and over again so they can really understand that when they're formulating the thesis statements and progressing in their project, they really are focusing back onto the theme. In the end, um, this is inquiry. Students are going in doing these independent projects on their own with their own topics and really just learning how to research and how to think like a historian. So on my um, last note, um, I really, my, the best advice I want to give to um, teachers is really that it takes time. This takes time. It's not going to happen instantaneously where kids are going to understand how to be a historian or think like a historian instantaneously. It's going to take time. But when it does click, when teachers, when students really understand what history is, it's going to be rewarding. And, you know, by having kids go up there and just experiencing being in front of the judges and being able to talk about something they're passionate about, um, it's something that's really going to be beneficial for them in the long run. You know, I had six graders last year who are doing it now for all three years that they've been in it. Uh, or I had six graders two years ago, and now they're eighth graders. And they're really invested in it. And they want to improve and be better and better every year. Um, and so if you have any other questions, feel free to um, ask some questions at the end of the uh, webinar, or you can feel free to email me. My contact information is on there. And I'll pass it over now to um, the student presenter, Elena. Hello, everyone. My name is Elena Hildebrandt, and I am a student. I'm a junior in high school, and I've competed at the national level in sixth grade and last year as a sophomore. And I've done um, very well at both uh, competitions. And so I was just going to talk about what my teachers did um, this past year especially and what helped me to compete at such a high level. So I'm going to go over three main topics that I thought were some of the most important things that they did for me. The first was helping me to find a topic that I absolutely loved and was really interested in. Now, um, Matt talked about this a little as well, but you have to pick a topic and make sure your students are picking topics that aren't too broad, that they won't be able to find information. Like, you can't pick um, the golden era, um, but you have to pick something that's um, is specific to the student and is specific to the time period as well. And then um, they have to actually really enjoy the topic and love the topic. Now, that was um, specific to me last year. I was really interested in labor relations, and so I picked a girl my age who had made an impact. And so I'm still doing um, work on the project and still learning more about her as well as entering her into the um, the Hall of Fame, the Women's Hall of Fame in Iowa. So once you really love the topic, it'll make sure um, you do better at the competitions as well as remember it for the future. Now, the second major thing is um, the focus in different classes. I had two teachers that helped a lot last year, and it was in English and my history class. And so having two different styles of going about the project as well as different focus areas in the two classes helped as well because the English teacher would focus more on the research paper and the antidote bibliography, but the history teacher would focus more on the historical importance and the impacts that it had. And so making the um, connection between the two um, was also extremely helpful, understanding that there are two separate sides that are very different um, for the topic. And then the third thing is the feedback that I received. And so going from different levels that Millie talked about, especially between districts, state, and nationals, um, really changed how my project was and how I um, treated it. Now, first, my, at my school, we did an initial showcase, which was a couple nights before our district competition. And what happened there was that students, parents, and teachers were all able to watch uh, or listen to your projects. And so you get feedback from people all walks of life and different backgrounds. And so getting that background then before I even started competing was really helpful because you'd be able to change your project before but also be able to see what feedback was actually important to you and to change the, the project. And then um, an important thing as well for teachers for after the district level and after even the state level going on to nationals, some of the 
um, help from the teachers and the schools kind of dropped off, and it became more of an at-home project. So making sure that even though um, plenty of the students that may participate in Night History Day don't make it to the further levels, continue to focus on and work with the students that do really helps as well, rather than making it more of a home project. And so also, as Millie was talking about with the judges' feedback, when you're reading all of these sheets that they give back, plenty of the material is really helpful, but narrowing down what you actually need to change for your project is also really important. And that happens because rather than changing your entire project for just one judge, because all judges have completely different opinions, because judging is entirely um, subjective, you have to pick the ones that you think is important and you also see an importance in. Because you have to make sure that the student's project is still their project and is still important to them. So um, the initial showcase was really helpful because of the, the background from everyone, even people who hadn't done History Day, but um, would make it more interesting for people in the future. So those are the three major topics that I thought were the most important that my teachers really helped me to compete at such a large level on. Hi, everybody. This is Elizabeth Dinschel again. Um, and we got a lot of questions about where you will be able to find this afterwards. Real quick here and show you that you can go to the National Archives YouTube channel, and that is www.youtube.com backslash US National Archives. Um, it will also be on the Herbert Hoover National RI YouTube channel, in case you remember that more for some reason. Um, teachers, if you want to stay up to date with what's going on with the National Archives, there is a National Archives Education Facebook page. So it's specific just for education. Um, and you can see here we have the education tab and whatnot. And, um, if you, if you look around for some friendly faces, maybe you'll find some of your presenters like me. I'm, I'm up here on Facebook, too, and you're welcome to friend me. Um, but definitely find the, the uh, National Archives Education page. It will have the link up to the direct YouTube channel, and we'll send up a follow-up email with it as well. All right, um, I think we're ready for questions. This is Nilly. Um, one of there was a question submitted to me during my presentation. Um, someone asked, how, "How do you distinguish between a solid National History Day topic and something that is more of a current event? Um, how old does a topic have to be?" Uh, there's there's no hard and fast rule about how old an event or a topic needs to be. In in Iowa contests, we use kind of a rule of thumb of of about 25 years because the whole point of the History Day project and the analysis and, and synthesis is that students can evaluate the significance and impact of their topic in history. So if they pick something that is a current event that happened you know, within the last few years, it's hard to tell what the impa impact and change over time is going to be because we can't see into the future and see that. So we like to tell students, you know, think about something that you know, maybe 25 years ago or more, um, sometimes a topic more recent than that, you can still you can imp you can evaluate the impact and change over time, but it's really hard to do that with a current event. So try to help students if there's a current event that really interests them, help them find that event's roots in history and have them do the research on the historical topic, not the current event. Just a quick reminder to the audience: if you would like to submit a question please use the send note button or the notes tab and address your notes to all moderators. Okay, this is Elizabeth and I'm, I'm, I'll go ahead and drive these a little bit. Um, we have a question up here that says, hi, this is Mark Kim and I will butcher this name so I will not attempt to say it. From Sierra Vista Middle School in Irvine, California, are the number of sources and their annotations more important than the quality of the sources? Um, I think Matt would be a good one to answer this. Um, I would argue that quality trumps quantity, uh, at least for me as a judge, and I would say for, for most of my peer judges. Uh, it's, it's not that you have 50 sources or 15 sources. It's that your sources uh, the materials are appropriate to your argument, 
uh, that your argument is sound, uh, and that you use your source as well. All right, our next question comes from Patty Kennedy, and it says, as a first-time teacher who is not planning on involving all of my students, what would you recommend as a way to roll out the project, and what criteria would I use to qualify student candidates? Um, I think Kennedy would be good for this one. Yes, definitely. I can answer that question to the best of uh, my ability. Um, in terms of like qual qualifications for students to student criteria, um, I would first just find students who are just interested in history. You can tell which students who are really interested, especially in my classes, I can tell which students really like social studies and are really into it. And from that moment on, just talk to the, the students who are interested who might be interested in doing this contest and be able to come up with some sort of like contract to let them know that this is going to be a rigorous process. Are you 100% committed to this? To this? Um, at my school, because we have it as an elective, students get to pick their electives. And so the students know in National History Day, so when they pick the elective, they know what they're getting themselves in. Um, but as a first-time teacher and not trying to involve all the students, try to find a way to move these survey students who might be interested in it, as well as how rigorous, you know, if they can handle this um, intense research. Now, I, we used to do it as a mentally gifted program, but now we're opening it to all students because all students are in, or some students are interested in history, and we want them to get involved. You know, they might be um, not as high on the standardized testing, but um, they are, if they're interested in history and they're interested in the topic and want to research it and find more about it, I will not discourage them. I will guide them in a certain way than guiding other students that I think this would be helpful for them in order to succeed in their project. Okay. Um, and next, one of the next ones we have, and I'm going to direct it to Millie, um, it says, Important to note that not all students are excited about changing their topics, i.e., improving it between site and county or district. I'm sorry, it's jumping around. Any suggestions for motivating those rather reluctant students who have spent their lives working on it so far? Motivating reluctant students is probably the most exciting task that teachers face. And I was a teacher before I took this job, so I understand, um, I understand the dilemma. Um, sometimes students do need a little bit of a break. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've got a student here with me. Sometimes students do need a little bit of a break, um, but sometimes it's just finding a new piece of information or something that helps spark that passion again. Um, sometimes it's looking at what projects have looked like that have gone to nationals before and you know I found students are highly motivated when they see something that's really awesome and then they look at their project and they want to make it awesome at that level as well. Um, so there's a lot of different ways, you know, show them what some winning projects have looked like, um, help them find a new piece of information or maybe someone else with a passion on that topic that can just reinvigorate their passion for their learning. Uh, this is Matt at the Hoover. Um, you uh, and other state coordinators are good resources to find those um, sort of ACES projects, those winning projects, because you have a, a little library of such projects. Right? Yes, we keep libraries of such things and pictures. I have millions of pictures. Um, I have a few questions here that are specific to projects from um, maybe students, maybe other people asking about um, help with finding specific information about people. Um, I have another one on the topic, government uh, censorship. Um, students, I think if we get into that, we'll spend um, too much time getting into specifics. So what I'll ask you to do is to shoot me an email at elizabeth.dinchel at nara.gov. And then I, if I can't help you, I'll forward your email on to one of our archivists that will help you out. Oh, and we spell it uh, D-I-N-S-C-H-E-L. And if you have a hard time uh, remembering that, you can find me on the Hoover website as well. Um, so I think we'll miss, we'll skip a few of those. Um, let's see. Oh, someone was asking if Elena would summarize her three points again. They got the first one, but. She, she lost the other two in the description. Sure. Okay. So the first one was just that making sure the students just like their topic a lot and have it 
narrow down to something specific that they can address. And then the other two, the second one was having a focus um, from different teachers as well as different classes. Like at uh, my school, the central or the um, English teacher and the history teacher work together with students to um, focus on different areas that are important. Because in the National History Project, there's the kind of the English side, which is the bibliography and um, the research part, and then the actual history part. And so having the two different sides was really important. And then the third thing was just having feedback from different levels, and that was kind of going off what Millie had said about knowing what's actually important to changing your project as well as um, what kind of feedback is really effective for you. Thank you. All right, another one we have is uh, from Deborah Surian. She says, our school has undertaken the NHD project for all social studies students grades 9 through 12, a grand undertaking to say the least. We are having some difficulty keeping the 12th graders motivated with the project. Any suggestions? Um, which moderator would like to address that? Um, I can as a teacher. Um, I, I think it's always a challenge to keep 12th graders motivated no matter what program or project you're doing. What I would stress with them is what comes out of it. So for example, I might stress talking about it on a college interview. I might stress this as your starter college project that you're going to go into classes next year and the professor is going to say 20 page paper, go, see, I'll see it in 10 weeks. Uh, but stressing that the skills that they're doing are not just about this project and quite frankly this project is the least important piece. They're stepping stone to where they want to be down the road and that's something that I would encourage and reinforce as much as humanly possible. As a former teacher, I taught for the last 11 years and a senior class advisor. I would also hold whatever capital you have um, as a way to motivate the students. Um, for example, is having this complete a ticket to a senior day or a senior prom. Uh, if you've got administrators who will back that, I think that's a great tool for you to put in your pocket. Okay, I'm going to address one um, that's off of here because I saw it as a judge last year and I've heard students say this before. Um, and this is from a middle school student that's doing an exhibit on the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. And they say that, is it all right if I have more secondary sources than primary sources because it's harder to get primary sources for an event from the 1870s? Um, so I'll address that to all the students and not specifically this one. There are always primary sources available. Um, that means you have to search harder. <laughs> um, 1870 is actually not that old of, a, of an event, and we definitely have primary sources available. Um, the key is making sure you're getting to the right places to look for those primary sources. Um, sometimes it's going to be the National Archives. Sometimes it'll be your state or local libraries that have special collections. Um, sometimes it will fall under the umbrella of your universities. Um, for a railroad exhibit, there are railroad museums scattered across the country, which are also great resources to start with. And another great way to find primary sources is if you go to your secondary sources and look at their footnotes or their bibliographies, they will cite their primary sources and where the primary sources came from, which is kind of like a road map to the primary sources that they use. And that way you always know what primary sources they've used for their, their book. Do you have anything to add, Matt? I'm just nodding my head vigorously because that's, that's sound advice. You always refer back to your secondary sources, but, uh, bibliographies and their footnotes. And if they've written annotated bibliographies like you're going to write, that's even better because they'll tell you what they got from that source and maybe even how they utilized it. Um, oh, and this is a, a good one too. Um, this one comes from Matt Elms. And he said, perhaps you want to mention that a part of History Day is getting kids to talk with someone about their project who is knowledgeable about their topic, primary or secondary. I try hard to get kids off the computer and with people to have historical conversations. And I kind of feel like this runs along that same vein. 
of making, emphasizing with the students that there's primary sources out there that they're not just going to get from Wikipedia or from the internet or from the books. They're actually going to have to step outside of the box and learn a little bit about research. And I would stress to teachers too, especially social studies teachers, to ask their students if they are doing National History Day projects. Um, I found in my years judging that there would be kids with a really great concept and you could just tell it hadn't been proofread, um, it wasn't put together very well. And when I talk to the students, I find out they did it independently and didn't have a teacher that helped them. So even maybe necessarily if your school isn't sanctioning it, there may be students doing it. I had a student message me earlier and say they were doing it as an after school club and he just now got the school to say they'd be involved with it. So even if your school is not doing it, kind of reach out to the students because sometimes they really need someone to proofread just their projects. Um, if there's anybody that would like to add to that, um, feel free. I might weigh in again. Matt Schaefer at the Hoover Library. I guess I'm going to identify myself because I'm the only guy on this uh, on this side of the phone. Um, but when um, History Day kids talk to me about connecting with you know a, a primary source or connecting with a a uh, someone who's written on the topic, the uh, I can tell you to every person I've talked to, historians, uh, folks who are active you know active in the events, are thrilled to pieces. Just thrilled to talk. To a young, to a student, about you know their, their research topic, their life, um, you know they're, they're incredibly flattered and um, take it seriously, take it very seriously. And for the students on on, on their half, I mean they're, they're part of this equation, they're part of the contract, is to know enough about the topic to ask good questions, which means having the secondary literature under your belt and and knowing what you know what you want to ask you know, the, the retired governor of the state of Michigan about, uh, you know, dove hunting in the 1980s, which is probably not a very good history of topic. I'd like to add, this is Millie, I'd like to add just a little bit to what Matt was talking to. It, it is vitally important that students have done their secondary research to formulate good questions when they're talking to an expert or someone who is involved in a topic. And when students are formulating questions, teachers, you can help them by Having them learn to formulate the question maybe in the theme language, you know, so this year it's rights and responsibilities, have them use those ideas as they formulate the question so that when they get their answer, you know, the, the respondent talks to them about the rights or the responsibilities inherent in their experience because that will help them tie it to the theme. And the other reason to go into an interview completely prepared and ready to go and asking in-depth and really great questions that students can't just find the answer somewhere else is because students are creating the reputation that History Day has for um, all of us out there. And you know, I'll go to libraries or archives or talk to people and, and I'll find out, oh, a History Day student came here and interviewed us or talked to us and they were the most professional, the best prepared and that's what I love to hear. So um, help students go into things prepared because it does just help build the stature and the status of the program as well. That may be a selfish reason but, um, but, but we like it. Um, let me just pose to my students on here because there's a bunch of students asking and we have um, a librarian asking too about how we classify different sources, primary, secondary, and tertiary sources, uh, especially talking about encyclopedias, um, emails. If you, in, if you do interview it's, uh, a professor via email, it is a primary source for the person to ask. Um, if we did a webinar for our students that explain the different sources, the primary and secondary sources, you guys can just type in the box for me whether or not um, you would like something like that. Because I think that might be something we could offer as you guys get into your uh, process papers a little bit more. Um, uh, and Lynn, can I get you real quick to look up, because someone was asking about how they would cite an encyclopedia according to the NHG rules, um, how that's cited. Good question. Um, technically, if we're going to be really, really technical about it, an encyclopedia article is a tertiary source. However, in the course of an NHG bibliography, we're only classifying between primary and secondary. 
For that purpose, I would put it in the secondary source category. But the question that I always ask my students about a tertiary source is, while it's great as a starter, if you look up you know, your person in World Book Encyclopedia to get the general overview, great. Is it the most important source to go into the bibliography? So, for example, um, kind of as Matt said, it's a great way, do you need it there? I personally am on the side of 15 great sources, really well used is more important than 50 or 60 sources that you've put in there just to kind of beef it up. Okay, um, and it looks like we're getting a lot of positive feedback for the idea of a primary and secondary um, webinar, and maybe that's something we'll consider doing um, in the coming months to, to kind of help along with that process of the, uh, the bibliography and how to properly annotate it. I feel like as a judge last year, that was one of the weakest parts of the projects that I saw from our junior high school students. Um, they were using primary sources that were reprinted in books and then citing them as secondary sources. So um, I'd like to see that be a stronger part of, of how the students are able to put together their their papers and so they can say with confidence they're doing it the right way. Um, and oh, and someone asked if we suggest that the students separate their primary and secondary sources in the bibliography, so have two sections or put them together just arranged alphabetically. Um, I've seen them both ways, but I prefer to see them separated. I think it demonstrates that the student has a strong grasp of the difference between primary and secondary sources and that they did their research properly um, and that they can cite them properly as well. Uh, would you like to weigh in, Ange? Yeah, and I was going to talk with Lynn because she has a rule book. As far as I know, they need to separate them into primary and secondary sources. It is required by the rules that they are separated into primary and secondary sources. That, that's one of the rules. Yep. So, and it also helps the judges understand the student understanding level of what is a primary source and secondary source. Um, and someone just came in on here and said they've told their students no Wikipedia sites on their NHD bibliography, um, only primary and secondary sources. Um, they can use the citations at the bottom of the Wikipedia article to find further sources. That's kind of like the guideline that I was just saying that you should follow the secondary source, uh, you know, bibliographies to the primary sources. But Lynn, is there a specific rule saying that tertiary sources are not um, not permitted? No, there is no specific rule. This is one of those cases where I would use teacher discretion. Um, to me, when you're working with sixth graders, it might be appropriate to have those in there. Once we're in the upper levels of high school, they really shouldn't be citing Wikipedia or the World Book Encyclopedia. Use it to get some ideas, move on to better sources. That would be my recommendation. Um, and to the, the teachers on here that are asking if we can do the primary source um, during the day, um, we do, we can offer it through distance learning, so if you want us to work specifically with your class, to again contact me, um, elizabeth.dinchel at nara.gov, and we can set that up where we can either connect through AT&T Connect or through um, the video conferencing software to your classroom. Um, I don't think we really have any questions. Do any of the moderators see anything they would like to address in the question boxes? Yes, this is Millie. There was one question that popped up. Isn't it true that an interview is only a primary source if the person was alive during the time period? And I would say yes, that is true. Um, to be a primary source, the person has to have been, I would think of like an eyewitness, so an eyewitness and involved in something. Um, so if you're interviewing a professor about the Civil War because they're an expert in it, that does not make them a primary source. They are still a secondary source. You'd have to interview someone who was involved, which is a little difficult now considering the timing. Um, same thing with like World War II. A veteran would be a primary source, but a, a professor or someone who is an expert on the time but not involved per person would be a secondary source. Great. And I'll just jump in. This is Angie in Philadelphia. Um, this is where um, our language is really important um, because there are students who don't understand at first blush 
uh, that primary does not mean most important. <laughs> so um, I think, at, you know, as folks who are in archives or around primary and secondary sources all the time, we've come to use these terms without making sure that we're defining them for students. And um, in terms of a workshop for primary and secondary um, sources, I found that very helpful in Philadelphia. I, I used to do just a lot of primary source uh, workshops. And then I noticed that the kids' eyes were kind of glazing over when they heard secondary sources. Um, and these are students who are, who are just starting out. So now we do have workshops that look at the same topic, but with one primary source and a secondary source. So they get those two perspectives. And the kids, once they get it, they love it. You know, they say, oh, I wish I knew how to really look at and read a secondary source, because that's their key to helping them find those important primary sources. So that is, that is a key piece of things. Yeah, and I, you know, I, uh, I saw someone had popped up and said that in Florida you can contact your coordinator to get a site visit to do a workshop. Um, I know we're having one in Iowa here, so contact your state coordinators. And like I said, if they, do, if you don't have it available to you, there are distance learning options. Um, and also, I do want to say we talked about judging a little bit. We're going to be doing a, a judges webinar uh, sometime over the winter, so probably in like January. And then we'll also have that available on the YouTube channel um, so that it can be reviewed and used by coordinators as well, because judging, as Millie was saying, doesn't always mean that um, the students will get great feedback. So we'd like to kind of um, warm the judges up to the idea of spending some time and writing very deliberate review of the students' work so the students know why they received the ranking that they did, um, where they can improve, simple things like have a teacher review. Um, I know that we had sent two on from our division last year, and one of them was a great idea, and the other one was fantastically done. Um, and I thought that one would move on. But the second one actually took all of our advice and ended up going to fourth in nationals. So that feedback can really make a difference, and I think that um, the judges' webinar will help with that. Um, do we have any other uh, feedback from any of the other moderators? This is Lynn O'Hara. A couple people have asked me how to get on to get access to the NHD teacher newsletter. It's very simple. Send me an email to lynn, L-Y-N-N-E, -N -N -E, at nhd.org and say add me to the newsletter and I'll get you added tomorrow. That's all from my end. Uh, a quick thing about motivation. This is Hanedi Shatara, the um, middle school teacher. A quick thing about motivation is to really find out what our kids interested in and then skew it in a way that relates to history. Try to find a way to, to make it into it history. Um, for example, I had a student who was into mental illness and mental disorders and insane asylums, and we found through history a person who was committed to insane asylum wrongfully, and she used that as her topic um, for last year's National History Day project. So find something, like if students are having a hard time trying to be motivated for the National History Day project, find something they're interested in, and then find a way for that to relate to history. And to build on that, this is Millie Fries at um, State Historical Museum in Iowa. Find something they're interested in, and if there's possible local connection for research, you can't um, imagine the, the joy on a child's face when they are pulling you know, documents out of an archive and getting to see things for the first time and see the real documents and the real objects from history. It's a lot different than just looking on an Internet screen or um, only in a book. So local topics sometimes are the most engaging for students as well. And, and this is in Philadelphia, and I would just add that the key word in all of this is connection. So connecting teachers together, connecting students with archives, connecting students with sources, with people sources, and with written sources, that's really what, what uh, National History Day is all about, making those connections for students and teachers for better history education. 
Oh, we have one more question that asks, how can you tell if a topic is too broad or too general? And I'll give that one to Matt. Oh, God, this is like the definition of pornography, isn't it? Uh, you know it when you see it. Um, it depends. Oh, God. I, that's, it, I, I, it's hard to answer that question in, in the abstract. Uh, you know, if you want to talk about um, rights and responsibilities and, you know, the Great Depression, I'm going to say that's a little too broad. You know, things changed in the Great Depression in terms of how the government saw its responsibilities to its citizens, but you want to narrow it down to something a little more specific, like the bonus march or uh, the creation of uh, Social Security or, you know, um, but again, you know, it, it's, sorry, it's gonna, I, I'm not going to be able to offer a, uh, a hard and fast set of rules for that. Anybody else? Help me out here. Um, this is Ann from Philadelphia. I would say if a student isn't able to answer a teacher's why question or how question to why is it important or how is it important, if they can't say that in one or two sentences, their topic is too broad. All right, and I think that's a great, uh, great note to end on. It is 6.30, so I think we'll be closing down. If anybody has additional questions, um, you can address them to any of the people that you've seen on here tonight. Um, uh, we're all available. The PowerPoint will also be available off the National History Day website to download. Where will that be located, Lynn? In the classroom connection section, on the left-hand side, there's a series of buttons. The one at the bottom is called webinars. We'll have it all linked up there tomorrow morning. And like I said, it will be on the YouTube channel at www.youtube.com backslash U.S. National Archives.